Hello. Hello. Good. Okay, please take a seat. Um, we're here for this session is about the future of broadcasting. Uh, and I'm delighted to have two panelists here. We have uh, Jeff Nathanson, who's the Managing Director of International at Whistle Sports, uh, and Yu Hang, who's a Special Advisor to the Chairman of DDMC Sports Group. Um, before we start, or as a start, I just want to look back over broadcast history for a, a second in China. Uh, when I first came here in the late 80s and started in the, in the media business, it was a very clear state-owned industry. We had CCTV, which had the rights to the World Cup. Uh, it had the rights to German football. It had the rights to Italian football. And the regional network of broadcasters that were led by Beijing TV, Shanghai TV, and Guangdong TV took the English Premier League rights. And for over 20 years, that's what the industry was like. And if the Italian rights holders tried going to Beijing TV and saying, how about you take it off CCTV, there was no way through. The Premier League tried going to CCTV and said, how about you take us, there was no way through. It was a duopoly. There was no rights market in China. These were the only possible distribution platforms you had. And it started to change with the advent of the internet. It's now changed significantly from that time. And I'd like to start with Yu Hang. Maybe you can take us forward from that time, this old closed state system, to what we have now. How has it changed? Who's been driving that change? Right, I mean, uh, I have spent uh, in the last 15 years in the new media world in China. Um, basically, back to your point, um, beginning from uh, 2004, if, if, if I'm correct, beginning from 2004 because of the uh, fast speed broadband penetration in general in China, especially in the big cities, we see what we call today the, 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 the portal which means Sina, Tencent, Sohu at that time began to uh, invest into sports properties. In 2006, um, at that time there was a company called Newcom, in Chinese name the Xinchuan, uh, who purchased the World Cup new media rights in China. Uh, that created some, um, um, some competition and everything on the new media battle from there in 2006. Um, and after almost um, uh, 10 years, eight years in 2004, um, lost parts coming out of the way, so it's created a lot of troubles for traditional media. And Tencent at that time become uh, very strong in their sports portfolio. Um, and currently we see uh, the media market in general in new media is a, a little bit soft compared to the past two years, but still very competitive and the owner of the platform is very solid. Uh, I think in the long run, um, a company with a new technology of OTT uh, and some new technology being evolved in the future, uh, new media will occupy most of people's um, um, uh, time consumption mm -hmm. as their preference compared to the past, which you mentioned the close uh, system is the main preference. So that's basically the current and in the past the right. 15, 20 years about landscape, the media landscape in, in new media. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jeff, I mean, more generally, not just in China, but globally, how do you see this evolving, traditional broadcasters versus new media? Uh, I mean, there, there's so many factors that we can't really decide and see what's happening. I think that's what kind of scares the hell out of all of us. Is there's no clear, we've had such clear models in terms of what happens with premium live sports rights over the past 20 years. We have the premium broadcasters, you know, behind the subscription window. Everything's been fairly consistent. Well, we have a number of trends that are taking place that we're seeing outside of China, which is one is actually a decrease in terms of viewership of, of live sports on television, mm -hmm. and which is at an even sharper angle with young consumers, right? So what you're having is, is there's a natural decrease 
um, and at the same time, just a sharp fall off in terms of young people consuming live sports. At the same time, you're seeing a proliferation of new platforms that potentially could be competitors in this space. Everyone's waiting for the likes of Facebook and YouTube and Amazon and Netflix to step into the live sports space, but they are not. So what this is creating is a high degree of insecurity as far as the future is concerned, and that's what's really got us all kind of you know, in a bit of a tizzy as to what the future of live sports is, what are the distribution platforms going to be, and what's going to be, how are people going to consume and absorb content? Is part of that, you know, generation you're saying, young, younger consumers, is that a lack of patience? Um, why are they turning away from the core property, which, you know, the matches themselves? I think there's so many things that they're interested in now that we didn't have back then. When I was growing up, there was four channels, and then there was, uh, I thought the best thing that ever happened was when MTV came along, and all of a sudden I could watch music videos consistently on that. And for me, that was revolutionary. And now for my kids, it's basically they can watch whatever they want, when they want, and they can find it very easily. And I think there's an, there's an incredible amount of choice out there in terms of what they can spend their time. And equally at the same time, there's a degree of interactivity. They want to have a conversation. They feel very much that they are part. Young people feel they're very much part of the conversation. And in the meantime, traditional sports is always built on the same premise of doing the same things over and over again. We will have one person presenting a sports pre pre-game show with two former retired footballers talking about whether they're going to go 4-4-2 or what. Then they go to the sport, then go to the game, and then they go to the post-match, post-game thing, and there's a high degree of repetition and a high degree of irrelevance to younger audiences. You know, I think what is, I find really exciting about being in China and my travels around China is China's massive, the world's second largest economy, the U.S. is the first largest economy. Those are both growth markets for football in general, and the fact that international football is competitive against the domestic leagues makes it all the more intriguing. And yet at the same time, we're stuck with the same approach towards putting football into these two key marketplaces, which I think is really points towards an industry that really needs to be shaken up quite a bit in how they present that information. Do you, you know, in, within that new ecosphere. Um, you almost said paradigm. Well, yeah. You know, yeah we're, we're trying hard there. to stay away from buzzwords here. <laughs> no buzzwords, but Within you're Within this new market uh, of multi-channel options, how important does the live rights remain, the core subject? I mean, in China, can, can you imagine a situation where the World Cup's not on CCTV, right. where it's not free? But J Jeff is t totally right. I mean, my, my point in general is that the future of sports rights, no matter it's football, basketball, at the end of the day, you're competing with other content. You're competing with other content on the general assumption of a user's time. A user's time anyway is 24 hours per day. So I think the core value of the live rights for the, to, for the major property is still there. Uh, it's still part of somebody's lifestyle. It's still, it's, it's not necessary, your lifestyle, but still part of your life at a certain stage, uh, tied up with your emotion. Uh, but competition-wise, I mean, the millennial, the, the, the children born after year 2000, whatever, the young kids, I think they're tired with the current format in general, about 11 player play against another 11. In a, in a cricket game in, in, in India, you spend five days watching for a, for a cricket game. A, a baseball game sometimes in the US costs you about five hours. It feels it, longer though usually. If it, it it sometimes longer. even longer. But the, the point is not I don't like the game, it's I don't have that much time Focus on the basic thing. So that's, 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 that's the point. So, the core value of the live events still there, maybe more suitable for people like us. But more and more in US, in China, especially in China, the kids has so many options. E-gaming occupies 80% of the time. Whether that's still the trend, I, I doubt. But play football, <laughs> watching football, that's, mm. that's something out of their mind. 
I mean, that's, that's the problem. That's, um, I mean, I'm old as well. Right. But that's revolutionary. I mean, what you're saying is that the amount of live sport that people will actually sit and watch, and we only talk about 90 minutes, sure. uh, two hours with a football match, sure. is going to get less and less and less. Will, will, we, will we be left in a situation where it's only the World Cup final or the Champions League final that is watched live and all other sports events are just... They're, 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 they're reduced to edited highlights and... No, there, there is, those are also a fragment market begins. I mean, there was social media uh, shot clips. What, what was say the, the shot videos? Um, for example, the Premier League, uh, some, uh, uh, Red Latin people, I don't know whether they're there, they, they have Premier League on um, Douyin, for example. That's exactly a good try to see if the young generation is on Douyin, whether I can find a way to attract them there, but maybe not on live content but on other formats of content. So the content property, the, the, the property, the value of the content is still there. The Premier League is still one of the most popular games here. World Cup finals, uh, whatever, Champions League finals is still there. But watching live games now is a very valuable thing for ordinary sports fans, that's my view. Mm. Jeff, how do you think on that? I mean, I mean there's, there's so many things to talk about this. I, I think one of the key elements is, is we used to think that if we put up live sport that we'd naturally get an audience. And this is the proliferation right. that took place right. during that's the creation of cable yeah. and satellite. Yeah, when I was growing up and they put, you know, they'd have the super station and I watched the Atlanta Braves play, though I didn't care at all about the Atlanta Braves. Mm. But nowadays, with so many other options and all this amazing content that's available and amazing opportunities are available, if you put West Brom versus Swansea on, mm. Seriously? I mean, do we expect a young person to ded dedicate two hours of their time to that? No offense to anyone who might be a, a West Brom supporter at all or something like that. But the truth is, it's very difficult to get people to go to live and dedicate the time that's, unless it's really important. Now, there might be a good story to tell there that can drive people to these kinds of events. And there's some very strange things that we're seeing which on I social. Also doubt, which I also doubt, even if there is a some stories behind. In general, it won't be people's favorite. But you uh, see, what we've seen some really, really weird stuff happen. I've seen right. weird stuff happen right. recently, which there's a boxing match between two social influencers, mm -hmm. um, KSI and Joe Weller. Anyone here, these guys? Anyone know them? Basically, two social influencers have a grudge and they go say, we're going to do a, a boxing match. And they train for a couple of months. And they have a big following, big KOLs, and they get like 21 million views, right? On YouTube. On YouTube, of which a significant chunk of that is live. Mm. So, and then we see these guys, has anyone heard of um, uh, Barstool Sports? Barstool Sports has bought an amateur boxing league in Virginia in the United States. And they sat there and they, and these are not good boxers. These are not anyone of any quality whatsoever that you'd want to see box. But they hyped mm -hmm. it up through their podcast so much that they had 40,000 people pay for this bad boxing match. So it's not necessarily, some of the conversation goes away, well, it's got to be about the quality of the football in order to go to the live match. But it's also the quality of the storytelling that leads up to the live match that's really important to convince people to say, if there's a good story around West Brom Swansea, then we have to get that out in the week. So in the past, we would depend on the broadcasters to say, mm -hmm. to bring the audience to the event. But with viewership dispersed over all these different locations, it's increasingly up to the clubs and the leagues to say why you need to watch. And they have to do a much better job of telling stories leading up to the match. Individual players. What are these individual players' FIFA ratings, right? All these weird things that you can do. But if you can get 21 million people to watch bad boxing, you can get a lot more people to watch good football. It just requires a greater effort, and we can't be stuck in the lazy way of telling storytelling just because it worked in the past. No, I mean, uh, that's very good. Um, I think I take, take the point. I mean, this is revolutionary change for people like me. Uh, uh, I'm still trying to com come to grips with the fact that it's not just about the live, but obviously things have moved on a lot. I, I want to talk a little bit about original content. Uh, you know, you just gave an example there, a boxing match. Um, it, it, it turned into a boxing match, which is a sports event, but it didn't come from the professional sport at all. Talk to me a little bit about original content. How can, say, a place like China, which is, in broadcast at least, has been so dependent on in, incoming entertainment content, are there any opportunities in football or even wider for China to create original content, either in broadcast or 
targeting directly the social media viewers, or is it too late for that? Well, we, we see we see the, the we see there is people trying to not the government, but in general, people trying to go out of China to spread uh, what we thought the, the, the Chinese sports will be. For example, people at the sports administration try to broadcast the Long, Longzhou, the the the, the, the Longzhou, the, the boat racing, oh, yes. traditional Dragon boat racing, racing yeah. uh, live uh, that in U.S. and U.K. Yeah. It never works. I think that's, that's impossible. But we see also the, the CSL uh, began to um, to have uh, carry on live on, on, on 72 broadcasters in general in the world. It's a good sign. I mean, people is working hard to make what happened here to be known outside China. That's, that's always a target. Uh, but unless you have a very good story to tell, uh, and we see why CSL can be shown on Sky because there is very famous player joined the CSL teams. That's, that's one reason, the important reason. Unless you have that happens, otherwise it would be very difficult for domestic content, original content, to be shown on some what we call mainstreaming platform. But also accompany with what we see the the, the uprising of uh, the e-gaming. Mm -hmm. um, uh, E-gaming, uh, let's say that the, the, there was many good uh, club teams here in China. They have their own platform on, on, on Twitch, for example. Yeah. They, they broadcast every day, they podcast every day. If, if you think this is also kind of original content, that's, that's also a trend that we can see. Jeff, original content, where, where do we go? Where, where do we generate this? There's so much to be done, and with the cost of production coming down and the cost mm -hmm. of distribution coming down, there's so many opportunities to experiment with programming around the sport, programming around, uh, programming around football. One guy I like to point towards is one guy we work with is a guy named Robbie who runs Arsenal Fan TV. And if you're an Arsenal supporter, you probably love him because he's the honest voice of the fan. And it, if you're a member of the Arsenal uh, management team, you probably like him less because he's a bit critical of what the management does. But he creates four or five days worth of programming, a podcast, He's outside the stadium before matches. He's outside the stadium, the Emirates, after matches, doing interviews with the fans. And this is just a fan talking about the club he loves. This can be done and replicated all over the world, geared towards Chinese audiences. The cost of Robbie's setup is two guys and a couple of cameras. Mm -hmm. And if I was to look to try and make live sport, where we see such an incredibly, incredible excitement in China around football and NBA basketball and basketball in general, I would expect to see Chinese language bloggers, vloggers, podcasters around every major sporting event. And they would be the kind of people that would find a way to get people excited about sport and get people building up towards the live event. That content is equally, you know, I think that there's a much closer divide between what we used to call shoulder content, which is content leading up to the game, and then the live sport, live game itself, I think they're much equal, more equal in terms of their value, and I think we, put, we equate too much value with the live and not enough with the story around it, especially with the proliferation of social and digital distribution channels. However, it's really important that sports bodies, clubs, leagues, broadcasters experiment with formats, try something new, try something different, and don't just sit there, we're going to have a couple of really old guys around the studio set talking about the way things used to be because that's boring to young people. I think you know, one of the things I would sit there and say when you create programming is one of the biggest gateway entry points for young football fans is through FIFA 18. Mm. And if you're not using FIFA 18 as a means of reaching a young audience, then you're missing out on things completely. If you're not using the kind of KOLs that are talking about FIFA as part of the package that you use to get excitement around your life, you're missing a real major opportunity. And people sit there and say, well, it's e-games, e-sports versus live sports or e-sports versus real sports. If you play things well, if you use things correctly, they can actually be complementary. But you have to be creative. You cannot sit there and use the tropes that have existed for the past 20 years on telling stories around sports. And, so, and, and yeah. also we see the, 
there is cup of sports that in China is is very strong. For example, the volleyball mm -hmm. and table tennis. And there was the, their own way. I Arena is run a, a new uh, volleyball league. Mm. Basically, broadcast those overseas. That's at some point. Uh -huh. at, at certain spots, we can try in the niche market whether the original content can be popular also overseas. Uh, we, we see some chances as well. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. it's an opportunity, isn't it? I mean, football may be too late for original content, but those other sports where, where China's strong or even regionally, uh, uh, where you're showing uh, Asia head to head. Well, and also, uh, football is also trying. Yeah. I don't see it. It's not too late for China football. Right. I mean, when, we, when, you're, when, you're the, when you're as big as China is, I mean, the opportunities are enormous. Yeah, I, I was thinking more late. internationally. I mean, you. you, you exporting, uh, exporting. Yeah, exporting. Do you see the CSL becoming a real big watch in Europe and those other markets, or is it limited? I mean, you know. And the other way around. I, I, I just want to say that Manchester City has won the Premier League for the second time. I think anything's possible when you consider a club like City is now a global powerhouse. I mean, forgive me for bringing that up, but you know, I mean, anything's possible do, in the world of sport. Do, do you think that, you know, the um, the CSL as it's grown, we've got a lot of players coming in and everything. Um, is that eating into the time people are spending on the European leagues, or is the CSL something different? Is it in its own cultural space? Right. I always say CSL is domestically is different. I always say. I mean, fans have their, their own uh, supporting teams, the Manchester United, Real Madrid, whatever, but the, the emotion, the, 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 the time and the convenient in a way that they can go to see a live game is, is totally different. Um, the experience behind that experience is totally different. So, um, I would say domestically for fans will will definitely be different compared the the emotion they put in in other leagues. Mm. But I, I won't say that they can't have two or three supporting teams. I mean, uh, right. one as Beijing Guan, one as Manchester United. In, in many in many cases, that's also a balance. That would be great. I mean, if, if they had one Chinese team, which I think they do, and one foreign team. What? But as I understand it in China, you, you've got a large number of people who we call serial supporters. So you were to ask the question, what's your favorite team? They may say Beijing Guan. And in England, I follow Manchester United. And in Italy, I follow Juventus. And in right. Spain, it's Real Madrid. Well, that's their choice. Um, and, but are they then consuming those brands really loyally, or is it divided? So actually only a fifth of a fan. Are they real committed fans where clubs can see monetization coming back? Or are they hopping channels, just dipping in and dipping out, which would lead them more to the type of storytelling content? Well, right. I still say they're, they're, they're loyal fans mm. for, for whatever brand they support. They're loyal fans. But supporting a, a, a local team, which you can somehow easily to access either to the stadium or the team or the players, compared to a supporting team overseas in Europe, in England, in Italy, is, is different. Mm. But still, they are loyal fans. That's, that's my view. They can be uh, monetized in a way. Uh, do, do you concur? Or well, I, think, I think we're seeing that I always look through the lens and the prism of, of younger audiences. And what we've seen is a shift towards loyalty. First of all, this is the first generation of fans that's truly international, right? So we're dealing with markets that don't have strong domestic leagues that are that, 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 but that um, they're really looking for us to support a club outside of their home territory, which is something that's kind of unique because there's so much football out there. But the other thing we're finding is, again, going back to the trend of the importance of FIFA 18, is we see young people are following players much more than clubs. Mm -hmm. And that's because they put together their ultimate team, and their ultimate team is composed of players, and it's not composed necessarily of clubs so much. And so there's a lot more affinity with individual players. This is... Um, It'll be interesting to see what happens to the Messi fans as to whether they stick with Barcelona after, he, after he's gone, the same way that there's a lot more focus on these real, real strong personalities. Zlatan Ibrahimovic going to L.A. is a massive, massive story, and the world is captivated by it, despite the fact that M you know, the MLS is just not as interesting as what's happening in Europe right now. So I think the challenge we face is the trade-off between what's more important to the fan is it the player because that's the way they relate to them through, through FIFA? This is the young fan, 
or is it the club? And the question is, is whether the clubs, when they get this window with this player to truly hook this fan into the club mentality, as opposed to them waiting for the next star. So as Ronaldo moves on, do you become a Neymar fan or do you become a Mbappe fan? And I think the point is, is that if you look at it through the lens of the young people, a lot of the time, especially the international fan, it's going to be through the lens of player first and then club ancillary to the player. That sounds to me like a massive danger, challenge ahead of the clubs, ahead of federations. Are they reacting to this or are no. players taking control no, even think, more? Uh, for, 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 for local club, it's, it's also easy to engage with the fans. Um, but definitely the players uh, is the key. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you support a club, you support certain players that, that that's definitely true um, and the club need to make a, a, a better uh, showcase uh, to arrange those activations for the, for the for the for the club brand being tied up with the fans rather than a, a player image being being linked to the, with the fans if the player at the end they transferred and mm. those those fans no matter we think loyalty or not will also transfer that's the difference between your your real fans and, and your brand that's that's different in china do you think there's um i can see that the loyalty for clubs is very very deep say mm. in countries in europe mm. is that the same here or is it now fly by night i mean just follow my player wherever he goes i go he retires i swap to a different player are we losing are clubs losing that loyalty on which they've relied for a hundred plus years? I, 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 don't, I don't see that. In Beijing, for example, the Beijing Guan fans. When I watched Beijing Guan in, 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 in high school, that's, uh, that's 20, 22, 23 years ago. Um, if you ask me whether I'm still Beijing Guan fans, I'm still. But uh, once upon a time, I went to uh, Walker Stadium. I, 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 all of some, all of sudden fund that the fans attend the live games it's all children born after year 95 96 basically about 20 something so so i see that, that the fans also evolve mm. but the loyalties i mean still there i mean i didn't see that pe people because of the Beijing Guan changed their shareholding, then they, they don't support the Beijing Guan. I didn't see mm. that. Um, I'm gonna, I'll come back to you, Jeff, but I'm, I'm thinking about how those fans uh, in the Workers' Stadium watching Beijing Guan, to me, they are fans of entertainment rather than football. I don't see them coming away from the Gua Guan match and being inspired to go out and play themselves. The, these are entertainment fans, and often, certainly in the Workers' Stadium, looking for an opportunity to, to swear in public, to insult people in public, to let off steam. Sounds good to me. <laughs> in a way that, that's not possible in which China. Is, which is debatable. Do you think? Which is debatable. Mm. Um, I still see their loyal fans. I mean, okay. they, 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 they went there, they're spending three, four hours there around the stadium. It's, it's because they're, on their emotion, they want to support the team. I mean, that's... Um, that's a very simple reason. Mm -hmm. Whether they entertain themselves, for sure. Otherwise, why they need to go there? But it's not a conflict. Okay. I, I, think, yeah. I, think, I think this is a real interesting and challenging space because the aspirations for any club is, is to be enormously successful. And to be successful, you need to be international um, in the sense that you need to compete in pan-regional competitions whether it's the Champions League here or the Champions League in Europe. And the fact is, for that to happen, you need the resources necessary. You need the sponsors. You need the international fan base. You need to want players to come play for your club, so you need to have aspirations. So if you're catering to the folks that only appear, that are locals that go to your game on every Saturday afternoon, um, then you're not going to be playing in that space. You have to make that. All clubs are forced to be thinking internationally now. They can't just be thinking about their local, local fan base. And with that comes a whole different number of challenges and opportunities. Social media allows you to be global. 
Social media allows you to reach a global audience. International broadcasting allows you to do that. But with that comes the things that when you have your player time for marketing, do you take them to a local hospital charity or do you create a series of videos that will go global and appeal towards a global audience? These are the trade-offs that you have to make as a club to decide what your aspirations are. If your, sole, if your sole desire is to cater towards your local audience, then you're going to find yourself being very much a local club and having a difficulty playing in a wider space. If you want the bigger sponsorship money to come in and the bigger players to come in, then you have to be much more aggressive in what you kind of do on your communication. We, we, we have a lot of football brands which have certainly gone beyond their own geographical re region. Can, can that happen in China? I mean, will Beijing Guan, does it have the possibility to, to build hundreds of millions of fans across China, or does the geography actually dictate it doesn't go beyond Beijing? Right, I mean, if you talk about a, a local team got a supporter from other cities, which is weird. I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine a, a Beijing Guan got many supporters from Shanghai, which is very weird, but Barcelona can do in China uh, have fans in all big cities. Barcelona can do that, yes. but Beijing Guan maybe cannot. Mm. But I mean, you know, within that, uh, the Beijing market, I mean, that's yes. a big market, that's like yes. 20 million people. Yes. So that's enough for them to it's be that, getting like, on with. That's, huh? only right. about, that's only about, that's only about, what, seven, eight times the size of Liverpool, which has both <laughs> Everton and Liverpool within that space. It's a good domestic market. It's not bad. It's not right. bad, is it? Yeah. It's not bad. I Bigger than bad. many countries. Right. Um, but I was, I was surprised. Yeah, sure. I was surprised because when I went to a Shenlan match, and it was a Champions League match, how empty the stadium was, considering mm. how big the population is. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that a common occurrence in this? In, uh, well, I thought that even for the Champions League match, if there was some specific reason people cannot go, but normally when I see the, the Shenhua. Uh, ACL game is all full, so that's uh, that's surprising to to know that the, the stadium is pretty empty. I I, I don't foresee that. Mm. So I would say um, at, at that level, fans more should be more engaged to the game because you're competing with um, a foreign team, which is related to the to the to the to the to the, to the patriot. patriotism yeah na na nationalist no, that's, really? that's a different feeling that different emotion sure. um, I mean th yeah. to, to me to me I think one of the interesting thing is when there are opportunities to really gain focus attention on the on the Chinese clubs mm -hmm. is it being used to the best of its ability internationally I, I mean I believe uh, I read today that Iniesta is potentially coming over here and that is going to be massive, right? That's going to be massive. He's one of the greatest players. He's got a lot of attention. What is, and can the club and the league work together to really create the kind of excitement outside of the core audience to say, this is what Iniesta is up till now? Because LA does a very good job with that on Zlatan. Can you do the same thing here in China? with Iniesta and then use that to create greater awareness because from my perspective that would be something where the league and the club has to come together and say we have got something really exciting in the same way as a Chelsea supporter when Oscar came over here I loved Oscar I have no idea what he's up to right now he's yeah. a great player great personality he came here and it became almost like a black hole of information around him mm -hmm. and there's so many other ways to tell the stories about what's happening in China that is just not getting out because I would want to know what he's up to and I can't I can't do that. Well, that's a good point. Um, I mean China where does it sit in this technical change? In, in some ways I, I'm feeling that China is actually ahead of the game social media incredibly advanced here payment systems e-commerce platforms is China actually ahead of what's happening in Europe and you know, other opportunities, like Jeff says, I mean, Iniesta, those foreign players have come. There is a kind of like a blackout. Mm. Uh, and certainly fans that follow them internationally mm. lose, lose that link. Well, it depends on the technology, what, what you refer to. I sure. mean, you refer to in general the internet consumption, the, the new tech uh, in, in the uh, consumer electronics. That's, I mean, China is definitely on the, on, on, the, on the general infrastructure of the broadband penetration. So uh, at that a certain level, definitely China is ahead. Um, last week I was in Europe, a certain place, um, the, the, the 4G connection, the speed is really slow. 
I, 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 I really can, cannot get used to that. But, <laughs> the, but the, my friend living there in that city asked me, so if you are used, used to this, so you don't feel there is a problem, are you coming from somewhere which is ahead? And, and, and certain part, I mean, I agree that China is ahead, but if you talk about uh, broadcasting, if you talk about something related to live streaming, I mean, we are far behind what U.S. is happening also on the social media, on the, um, on the deployment that a, a application can generate, mm -hmm. uh, no matter is what we see on Facebook, uh, some, some new uh, function, what we see on Amazon, some um, also in Europe, what we have seen on, on Sky, even on their, on their big screen experience, uh, compared to the, the fancy engagement here, on the technology behind, I think we are far behind. Mm. So yeah, I, th I think you're in an interesting space here. I think China is really interesting because um, there's much more comp competition in the marketplace. There's much more proliferation right. of different apps. Like something like someone's had to explain to me what Billy Billy is the other day, and right, wa you right. watch it, and it's like this is right. the weirdest, strangest, most wonderful thing I've ever seen. Right. right. And there's a lot more. So you know, uh, um, for all intents and purposes, um, the West has become almost monolithic in the social platforms, mm. and there's not as much innovation. After the launch of Snapchat, we haven't seen as much innovation in the space as we thought we would see, whereas China's, uh, there's a lot more competition here. And I think you see the quality of the engineering and the quality of the products. And I think often in the West, we tend to make the mistake of trying to say, well, this is China's version of Twitter. And it's not. It's much more. There's so many different things. We see the proliferation of e-commerce here. We see so many, um, not just e-commerce, but um, um, payment, electronic payment systems, which make seamless payments. And so the innovation here is spectacular. Mm -hmm. I think where China has to look is towards the storytelling and has to engage in different types of storytelling around the sports and just accepting, you know, that we, that a lot of the platforms will sit there and say, well, we've acquired the rights for and fill in the blank. And then our work here is done and we'll take in a syndicated feed from them and then we'll show that last night the San Antonio Spurs mm. beat the Houston Rockets by three points and then that's the story but that's not the story not to young people because when you're looking to tell this you have to tell all the stories around it. you have to talk about the culture you have to talk about the music you have to talk about all these different other components around the sports you have to talk about the fans you have to talk about all these different areas of interest and touch points and not just say that just because we have the highlights of a sport or the live stream of a sport that that's enough and I think where China really has the opportunity to make some leaps is really in terms of the pro creative side because the technology side when you see it, the proliferation of platforms there's a ton of stuff going on here that is just fascinating. You know, with all of this happening, um, different platforms, different forms, different content origination which isn't even now necessarily related to the club itself but it could be the fans of the clubs or, or staff or, or people around it. Is there a, a danger that consumers become confused? Um, is there a danger that the messaging for sponsors becomes confused? It, it's no longer as simple as it was. Is, is that a danger again to the core sport at the heart of this? Or do we find a way around? Are our sponsors going to have to work harder in order now to, to reach what would have been a simple buy before? I would say that there, there, there is, is a global problem. I mean, there is nothing to do with China. I mean, currently we see uh, definitely the defense is confusing. It's not confusing. It's, um, it's, it's difficult of, of the, in different choice what, what, what you like, what you don't want what you want to see, what you don't want to see. I mean, sometimes your, your data has been leaked, so you, you have been annoyed by different things um, on, on your social media platform, on, on your, or your personal uh, related things. Um, I see uh, a survey uh, in, 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 in a few, few weeks ago about a misunderstanding for, for some official sponsor of certain tournament mm. being misunderstood by the fans to another brand, uh, mobile, um, or other electronic uh, devices. That, that's, that happens. But on, on the other hand, sponsors find also a direct way that they can engage with the fans directly. Mm. 
using big data, they can be oriented to the precise location of your devices at, at the right time when that user is consuming certain content. It's also a good thing. So technology creates troubles, definitely, but also bring lots of good positive part for sponsors, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm old, I'm really old, but I'm not that old that I remember the time when they broadcast the first live football match in, in the UK. But I, I remember reading, about the fact, reading the story about the fact that when they broadcast the first live match, all the, everyone was going to say, no one's ever going to show up again to watch a match. They're just going to watch it on yeah. TV. Well, guess what? There's record attendance, that, record attendance right now at Premier League clubs. And you have these enormous stadiums that fit 60 to 70,000 people that are sold out every week and despite not even having the size of the population in Beijing, right, right. they do pretty well in terms of filling out the, you know, the, the stadiums in Liverpool. Um, equally, I don't think people remember back, because again, the perspective you have as an older person is, is when the Premier League first ca was created and put on Sky, um, the Premier League, English football did not have a great reputation for either style, quality, or international following, right, per se. There was a couple of leagues that were doing a bit better back then. But because Sky and the Premier League embraced innovation and technology, distribution through satellite, allowing, fighting for more matches, fighting against regulation, all of a sudden the Premier League is the most powerful and most wealthy league in the world. And there's some questions as to whether it's the highest quality football because there's a difference between the popularity and the quality. And that's one of the arguments that's continually taking place in Europe. Um, so, yes, the technologies are disruptive. Yes, there's so much that is dispersed upon different locations, but this has all happened in the past, and it's the organizations that see the opportunity, and this goes to what you said, it's seeing the opportunity within the chaos where you'll see, real, you'll see people really, really strive and come up with opportunities. I think that it, it, we're seeing like uh, Roma in the uh, Champions League semifinals, mm -hmm. and one of the stories that's come out of the Roma stuff is, you know, Serie A is not perhaps the greatest league or best-run league on the planet, but Roma in that space has seen a real opportunity, both in terms of their global communications, their social media, their digital offerings, and so we're seeing not just with the success on the pitch, but equally in the success on fandom. That's really quite interesting and contrasting with a lot of the other trends of what's taking place within Italian football right now. And so, yes, it's a scary, scary, scary time. But the, for the people who are willing to innovate and try different things, those are going to be the people that we're going to be talking about 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. In the same way we talk about the success of the Premier League. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, you know, the same opportunities present themselves for all the different leagues in this space. That's great. Um, we do have a couple of minutes left, so if there are any questions from the floor, uh, we'd be very happy to take them. If not, you're going to have to do your rendition of Beyonce. Come on. I'm not going to sing. Um, you know, people complained. The, the panels aren't interesting enough. Let's have a question from the floor. There must be are they surely one that, question. Are they, are they complaining that the panels aren't interesting enough? I've heard it. Not, not on my panels, but here, here we are. Uh, Sean Philippe for Lanshin Sports. Yes. It seems to me that uh, some of the uh, sports IPs are going back to CCTV. They want to, the games broadcast on national TV. Did you see a new trend going on, especially to Mr. Yu Hang? Do you see a new trend? Uh, does it mean the mean that IP holders has to rethink their positions in negotiating, uh, negotiating their broadcast rights deal? I mean, that's a, that, that's a very good question. I mean, there should be a long, there, there can be a long version about your, your, your question, but I mean, all the rights holders cannot ignore the fact that as the, as the national, as a state broadcaster, CCTV covered over 400 million households, and no rights holder cannot ignore this fact, and this fact will influence their outcome on the sponsor part, although most of the major uh, rights holders revenue generating from their um, media rights revenue, but they, they cannot ignore both the brand and the sponsor part. So yes, back to your question, yes. Um, I think some of the rights holders began to rethink really about whether they need to back 
on the free TV, which in the past two years there were a couple of task force, a couple of platforms working on whether a paywall can be set up. Uh, but that's a conflict. Um, I would say there is always a balance between free content and paid content. And, and, and the, the ultimate question is how a healthy and sustainable commercial model can be set up um, and within this current circumstance in China, which is definitely strange because there is TGNA and the teacher and, and the, the, the main companies so that's totally different. So that's, that's, that's a short version to your question. Hey yeah. guys, how are you going? First of all, it's a great, great talk, by the way. It's been really good. <laughs> it gives me soften them up a little bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is a question for you, Jeff. Um, with your comment before about the declining live sport audience for young people, and assuming that sport is playing less of a role in their life, in those young people's lives, what impact does that have on the future of the business model of live sport, and what can they do to fix it? See, I don't, I, I don't think it's necessarily, I don't think sport is becoming less. I'm not quite sure about that, right? I just think that live sport consumes so much time. Yeah, long form, like long sitting form down for two hours or but, three hours. But there's so many more touch points. Like, uh, there's so many more touch points you have with sports fans, right? So I'm not watching, I'm not watching three football matches a weekend, uh, uh, every weekend, but I'm on my Instagram feed, what, 12 times a day? And I'm watching a bunch of short videos in that and the majority of my feed is sports related mm. and then we're talking about stuff like instructional videos that are getting people out of the house and doing stuff there's so many different touch points for sports that i never had growing up i would have the sports live on tv at night and then the newspaper in the morning and no nothing else whereas young people are, are having so many and with that comes so many opportunities for participation for brand integration and brand um, involvement, for telling stories around sports that we didn't know existed before, right? What about um, even from a, like if you look what happened with 2020 cricket, which wasn't around 10 years ago, That's it, you look yeah. at what's happened to Big Bash cricket in Australia. It's great. It's unbelievable. So you've got these sports, like very traditional sports, now going, well, how do we, how do we create a product that's actually watchable? Is, it gonna, is that a thing that you think is being considered Platforms like MLB or... Uh, people, are not, people are not innovating as much as they should in the area of sport because often we get too far too precious. Mm -hmm. Futsal does amazingly well on social media, right? right? Like, people know, like, if you look at, like, Falcao futsal videos, people love them, millions and millions of views. And yet, there was, there was, a, there was the Futsal World Cup in Bangkok two years ago or something like that, and no one watched it live. It was buried on Eurosport. The time zone was off in Europe. I can't say whether it was bigger over here or not. But people love futsal, but it's not packaged up the right way. Young people are watching Panna. Every, who knows what Panna is? This is a football group. You must know what Panna is, right? Hands, hands, who's, who knows what Panna is? One. Okay, a couple. Panna is one-on-one -on -one football. Watch it when you get a chance, where basically if you nutmeg a player, you basically win immediately, or you score a series of goals. It has an enormously powerful freestyle element to it. It has a culture that's geared towards younger younger audiences there are scope there's real scope for innovation within within sport that can appeal towards younger people but you have to find a way to do it you can't just accept because my father and my grandfather were lead supporters that i will be a lead supporter until my end of the day you cannot take the young person for granted and if you and the young fan and if you start to innovate and start doing things and see things through their prism what's really exciting right now is, is if you watch there's like um um, there's a, the e FIFA World Cup, which is uh, the E-World Cup, which is taking place. Parts of it is taking place right now. The audiences are enormous on this, and these are people playing video games. And it's tied to football. You just have to recognize that the fans are coming from a different direction. And then there's so much more you can do with them if you embrace all the different platforms as opposed to restrict your brand messaging or your monetization strategy across that two hours on a Saturday afternoon, and that's the only time I'm going to do that. And you're going to have much more opportunities if you really look at the whole community basis around football and not just get stuck with what we've done up until now. That's great. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. I see we're already uh, well over time, so we'll, we'll, we'll we call got a halt. We've got now. another 40 minutes now. 
Uh, we'll call a halt there. Uh, thanks very much to the two panellists. Uh, really fascinating for me as an older person. Uh, I, I'm feeling much more positive now uh, about the opportunities for engaging people in sport, and it certainly is a revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.